want to check that I'm Oops. sorry okay. uh, okay, so. welcome to uh, uh, this money marketing uh, roundtable uh, on a potential COVID-19 uh, wealth tax uh, and its implication for financial advisors. Uh, my name is Michael Climes and I'm the uh, Pedges reporter at Money Marketing and I'm joined by a, a wonderful a group of panellists to discuss this very important uh, topic and I will just quickly hand over to them uh, uh, for them to just introduce themselves uh, briefly. Uh, hi my name is Amir Roshalima. Uh, I'm a partner at Holland Hahn and Wills we're a financial planning and wealth management firm based in Kingston upon Thames, and we specialise in retirement planning. Hello, I'm uh, John Cowan. I'm the chairman of Sesame Bank Hall Group. But, um, it's a network of advisors on one hand, and the other side, Bank Hall, we are a support service company to financial planners. We're based up outside Manchester. I am Kusal Ariwansa. I'm a Chartered Financial Planner at Appleton Gerrard and nowadays my main role is uh, intergenerational wealth planning with the clients I look after and I'm based in Manchester. Hi, I'm Tony Wickenden, uh, Managing Director of Technical Connection, long-time contributor to money marketing, too many years probably, um, too many words. Um, and I think Michael's asked me to say a few words to start this subject off. Is that right, Michael? Shall I just go straight? Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just, just set, okay. set the scene for us briefly, please. So I think, well, why, we're, why we're talking about this, if I understand it correctly from, from you, Michael, there was an FT article a couple of weeks back, which followed up on an earlier FT article based on a survey run amongst FT readers. Um, 1300, so relatively small sample size. And I think it's important to give that context to this because small sample size, if you read the 457 or something comments that readers, I always find the readers' comments to the FT really interesting. But you know, you can, it, you got some really interesting sort of comments on that on who were those 1300, were many of them students on free subscriptions? All of that, we don't know the nature of those. So, so we need to see that survey for what it was, but it said roughly 50% were in favour, roughly 50% weren't in favour, which more or less reflected a kind of YouGov or Mori Ipsos poll. So that was the background to that. And then we were, we're talking about it, of course, because it keeps coming up, doesn't it, in the conversations around government debt and that big question, well, how are we going to pay for it? For God's sake, it's billions, and it is. And when we have 55 billion, just doing a bit of history, 55 billion was the predicted public sector borrowing requirement for this year, and everyone gasped. and went, wow, because we're going to level up and we're going to spend on infrastructure. And there was a, listen to this, there was a 12 billion special one-off one off injection to help with the economic impacts of COVID in March, 12 billion. Okay, so then we got to the summer and the borrow borrowing had jumped to 372 billion. So that was because of job support scheme, job retention scheme, self-employed income, all of that. And and we'll get the financial statement on the 25th of November, I think, and that's it's predicted it's going to be 400 billion. I think the important bit is the relationship between debt and GDP, and it's about 100%. But we've been there before. It was 250% when we had the war, and it's gradual. So I think the point is, I think we don't need, my view is, we don't need immediate, massive, draconian tax increases because we can afford the debt. The International Monetary Fund, the MD, very relevant this, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund yesterday in the FT was encouraging economies to keep on supporting their their economies, encouraging countries to keep on supporting their economies through the pandemic and then further stimulate post the pandemic and after that get their public finances on a stable footing. And and Rishi Sunak sort of came and said, see, that's what I'm doing. Basically, that's why we push the budget back. That's why we're not doing anything now. Mm -hmm. All of that. So that was the I think this is the background with people, well, we've got to pay this back. I know, what about our wealth tax? You know, because there's either increased rates don't spend as much, so we're not going back to austerity, I don't think, increase rates, or have a new tax, a special mm -hmm. COVID tax, because we all, you know, the whole thing, if we all want to help out, it's like the financial version of clapping, and just so let's do that. Um, and Manchester, Manchester Metropolitan University did this little academic study, which was really interesting, they said, if, just saying, if 
everybody, if we had 2% on everybody's wealth, mm -hmm. that would be about 300 billion, sorted, basically. Except that we don't need to do that. And yeah, how are you going to get the money? And then that leads to the, the many questions around wealth tax generally and our experience of it in the world today and in the past and the challenges we've had. So I'll stop talking now. Okay. And I'll I won't stop for the rest of the time, but I'll throw that back to you, Michael. No, thanks a lot, Tony. That's that's a, re a really great uh, introduction to uh, to a topic with some good good numbers. Um, uh, some questions I think which can uh, underpin this discussion, which which we can begin to um, unpack now, are uh, questions like: Should there even be a wealth tax? What assets would you include if you wanted to introduce a wealth tax? How would you value the assets? And, uh, and how do you collect the, the tax? Um, and then going into more granular detail, you know, what could it, could advisors actually do to help their clients prepare prepare for one um, if, if it indeed uh, does does materialise? Um, so on, on the, the first one of those, should there even be a wealth tax? Um, do I have any uh, uh, takers? Uh, Michael, I think, you know, in the main, this is a personal bias. I'm not a big fan of wealth taxes, although, as I'm sure Tony will agree, they're, they're, they're part and parcel of our economic life. I mean, if you think about it, the council tax on your home is a form of wealth tax. The bigger the home you have, well, the bigger the, the, the amount of tax you're paying on that. Um, but it's it's really hard to define wealth. That That's the problem, right? And depending on how you define it, it sounds like you're penalising people who have been successful in life. And if you look at the UK's stand on its economic policy, or probably it's the most right wing economic policy in Europe. OK, it, it, it encourages capitalism. It tries to encourage innovation. But at the same time, I think there's some political maneuvering that we all have to be sort of mindful of here, because, you know, if, if you just put the cost of this crisis uh, into the public debt and, and just try to try to say what, what Rishi is trying to say, which look, we can afford this and look what we're doing. It sort of gives people this idea that, well, hang on a second, we're getting future taxpayers to pay for all the benefits that we've been able to, to, to uh, enjoy through the government support today. It, does that discourage future entrepreneurialism and innovation? I don't know. So I think that there's, a, there's two things here. There's the wealth tax that today is just speculation. <laughs> And then there's the political maneuvering behind it to position it in a way where, you know, as Tony alluded to, some studies show that the actual number, the actual percentage that we would all have to chip in, as it were, doesn't seem to be that big if it's spread across the whole population. But the messaging of this is going to be really important. I, I think I'd like to say that, you know, if we if we step back a moment and say, what what would it, what would it, what would it, what if this idea of wealth tax been kicking around for years, Tony, hasn't it? I mean, as long as you and I have been around, but. And we know there are already wealth taxes and inheritance tax, stamp duty and property. These are these are all effectively and capital gains tax. These are all wealth taxes. So this one has taken taken hold because of COVID. People are saying we've got national debt, we're going to have to pay it off. So I think we need to work out why we think about a wealth tax. Is it is it to deal with structural inequality in the country, for example? And I don't believe this Conservative government would really want personally. I don't think they would want to do that. I don't think they would want to introduce a wealth tax to try and get a levelling up, as they've called it. Um, so if there's going to be a wealth tax, what is it for? Is it is it targeted? Is it is it of a short term fix or is it a longer term nature? And I think before this, we know that, that we know that the Chancellor was 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 looking to the Office of Taxation and Simplification mm -hmm. to try and look at inheritance tax and capital gains tax and bring some order to the whole capital taxes issue. My fear is that the, 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 the that rather like the Manchester study, it's very popular to go after commas, the rich, isn't it? But the reality is it may not yield very much. So I think we need a much more mature and sensible debate about this. I don't believe that, that my last point is with you, I don't believe that the point about we could just parcel up this debt and and, and like the Second World War, we kind of we kind of work our way through and perhaps inflation will take care of it. But that's mm. generation. So I think there's going to have to be something that, that that tries to tackle it, but I'm not quite certain how he'll do that, other than we'll get to some of the potential options available, whether it's around pensions or capital gains tax. OK, Kassar, what about you? What, what, what are your thoughts? In quite simple terms, no, uh, there shouldn't be any further well, taxes. And I think uh, the analogy to draw here 
uh, would be if we compare the Manchester study to the Manchester Football Club, Manchester United. They have ongoing internal issues and they have tried to throw money at the problem and it has resulted in massive wastage with the end result being the same in consistency on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. You look at Liverpool, who are champions, they started with that model, they changed that and they became highly prudent and became very targeted and only bought based on a set formula and they're profitable and you can see their net spend compared to the others and their mm -hmm. success. That matches nicely. The problem we've got here is that historically and consistently, politicians have failed to spend money wisely. It is amounting to consistent wastage and it is not right to tax people who are successful to pay for their wastage. And I'll give you a prime example of something that is a complete waste of time and that is our nuclear deterrent trident. We are not going to get nuclear attacked, especially being part of NATO. It is a complete waste of time. It is going to cost 205 billion to renew it. Yes, I believe in the armed forces. I believe in protection, but we are not going to get a nuclear bomb on us and a deterrent isn't going to cause anything. So they're immediately something to look into. We just have this ability to waste money. So if we can prove that we're not wasting money, we are directing it to actual meaningful clauses where there's a direct impact, people will want to contribute more. The problem is at the moment, they're being taxed and where's it going? Mm -hmm. um, the PPE contract is a classic example that the app, 12 billion on the app, uh, there's wastage. I, I, I have a sense from the panel that on the first, first, first question, should there be uh, a world tax or not, everyone seems to be pretty unanimous, at least philosophically, um, that there uh, should not be uh, be, be one. Um, that, I would that's certainly, and for my part, I would certainly agree with what Amir and certainly what John mm. said around being, mm. being clear about what the purpose of this is. You know, one, mm. we do have that thrown down to the next generation, something to, if we can, you know, we all need to contribute, definitely it's only fair. But that, what is the purpose? Is it confiscatory? Is it to get money in? You know, what mm. is the purpose for it? And let's be clear about that, rather than just being seen to be doing the right thing from a, poli the right thing from a political standpoint. Really, really important that, because if it is to get money in, and all the rest, of the, all the point, points that John made, uh, and I would certainly endorse around how much it actually produces, you know, by evidence in the countries where it is, where there is a wealth tax, and there are only three in Europe where there's a true wealth tax, is Norway, Switzerland, and Spain. Mm -hmm. It's a tiny, tiny proportion of the overall, and it's just, it costs so much money to administer. So in terms of that whole spend, you know, if we're gonna do this, is it wasting money and time and effort that could be better directed anywhere else? And it's not being selfish and going, oh, I don't wanna pay it. But there is that point, isn't there, when people contribute to surveys. They don't generally support something that they is not going to affect them. Generally speaking, that seems. So, so one of the advantages of getting older is that you remember things like t uh, Dennis Healy talked about squeezing the rich. Exactly. <laughs> in seventy four. In seventy four, yeah. He yeah, and he did a green, had a green paper on that. He said, he said it took five years, and eventually abandoned it because it was going to cost more to, yeah. to, to raise the money. That's I would say, to Kuzel's point, I hope Manchester United's inconsistency on the negative <laughs> side continues right through till Sunday evening. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting, though, Michael, because I think it, just as just as importantly, I mean, if, if you if you survey us with a slightly different question, perhaps, and, you know, because a wealth tax doesn't necessarily need to be about taxing assets, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think it was HMRC that has put out a study saying that even a, I think, a single percentage point increase in the basic rate of income tax, so from 20% to 21%, would raise something like four or five billion pounds in 2020, 2021. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you position it in a way where, look, we're all in this together, this is the crisis, and we need to chip in with an extra one percentage point increase in your tax rate, Mr. or Mrs. Joe Average, mm -hmm. I honestly don't think there would be much uproar. Okay. So again, there is an element of political messaging here, 
Um, and it goes back to John's point. You you ex you ex you clarify and exemplify what this is for, and then you show that the impact on each individual isn't that much. I think it it becomes more palatable that way. Yeah, definitely. So. I mean, we've got the triple lock to deal with. Unfortunately, when you see the majority of tax comes from income tax and then I see and VAT, and they're the three things in the Conservative promise of the manifesto. I mean, I don't think anyone would really get too upset if there was another U-turn and they said actually things have changed. But that's a great point because it's shown. A small amount from a greater number gets you much further. I think it was 1p on income to get the same that 1p on the basic rate would have to generate. You'd have to put 4.5p, 4.2p on higher rate and 28p on additional rate. And that's where it starts. You get to that point, don't you? You know that American economist Arthur Laffer with that point, you can increase the tax rate to a point where the revenue starts dropping, even though the rate's going up The because people change their behaviours. You know, back in the day, brain drain, all that sort of stuff. Said, so I'm not staying it. I'm going. Basically, yeah. So it's it's almost taking us to the point of what his options are because it's uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Because he's got to balance it against keeping the economy going, mm -hmm. going of course, and not not depressing it. So he's got to be careful with VAT and so on. So there are there are obvious things he can go after, like the triple yeah. lock and pensions and so on. Because if you get the money, you know, if you get the, if it is to get money in, then it are those those are the three taxes where you will get most in, and aside from a one-off hit from on wealth tax. Because, but I think politically, to do a form of capital tax reform, both Amir and John referred to, you know, just capital tax reform, the OTS are already going to look at it, and I think CGT. IHT, not that many people pay it. So you'd also wouldn't upset that many people. I think I'm Mr. Stato on this. So I did a bit of research. How, 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 how about a windfall tax on the banks? They're always a good picking. That's always, <laughs> everyone loves a windfall tax on the banks. Yeah, definitely. They're, they're sticking their mortgage rates up at the moment. So they'll do a, a bit of a slap. Yeah, mm -hmm. windfall tax on the banks and Manchester <laughs> clubs. That's what the I bank, say. Manchester. <laughs> That's your headline right there, Michael. That's your clickbait headline. Right <laughs> um, all, all great, great, great points, everyone. Um, does the context of of uh, COVID nineteen though? Uh, we we have this word bounded about that times are unprecedented. Um, does 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 the context um, uh, make a a, potent, uh, um, a wealth tax or uh, uh, any potential wealth, wealth tax? Uh, more or less um, likely. I'm just thinking of for the fact, for instance, that a slightly separate point, but we've got a majority Tory government, and no, uh, and nobody thought, and who would ever, who ever would have thought, that in our lifetimes, a majority Tory government would have paid 80% of the wages of what was it, of uh, uh, about a third, third or more of the UK yeah. private, private private sector for six months at least and ongoing. So, so d does does that have any bearing on um, uh, on on what 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 we're um, discussing in terms of uh, implementing a wealth tax or not? That, that takes you back to the messaging again, or the purpose and the message. You know, the, the, if the message is look, we need we need to raise the money somewhere, guys, then a penny on tax is, is probably what people will do. If you call it a wealth tax, that's that you know that's a political divisive thing. And if mm. you saw you got survey, most people would vote for a wealth tax as long as it's not they're not in the in the band. Yeah. So. What is it? Seven hundred fifty thousand, I think they said, was the was the number. Yeah. Most people will tick the box and say, "Yeah, let's do it." But the reality is, it won't raise an awful lot of money. Whereas the real source of money will come through income tax or national insurance contributions, I guess. Could, could uh, I don't know? If I'm just thinking of uh, Theresa May. I remember Theresa May and her dementia yeah. um, tax, and that really harmed her. Could could a similar thing happen to to this government and Boris Johnson if there was such a visceral Emotional reaction reaction to the wealth. Tax is another example of it. If you get your message wrong, you're in trouble. Absolutely. Because there's several people out there that have high value assets, you know, particularly sort of like in terms of property values, but they're not necessarily cash rich. Yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you, uh, I mean, in my world, that's sort of a lot of elderly retirees who live in large homes that they've bought at a different time and saw the value of those sort of skyrocket over time. Oh, um, so are you really just going for, 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 for that with the wrong messaging? You do start upsetting a lot of people for sure. You also want to do it on a basis that it's that it's there's a system there that, that works already. And, and, you know, VAT or national insurance contributions or income tax systems work very well. If you start, have to go down the road like Dennis Healy found of trying to build something, it's probably it probably costs you more than than the, the money you're collecting. 
So rather than introduce a new tax, it's much more likely if they're going to do this, is they'll dress it up in a different way, not call it a wealth tax, and just move the existing rates, whether it's capital gains tax to income or whether it's uh, whether it's income pay. That's much, personally, I think that's much more likely, and I, not I, a wealth tax. No, I'd, I'd certainly agree with that. And certainly, if you can see, the capital tax reform, no one would really... The OTS proposals are fairly benign in relation to IHT. The all-party parliamentary group proposals are a little more radical. If you mix that in with the CGT reform, which will get headlines and saying, look, we're the, the, we're putting it on the shoulders of those who are best able to bear it, but, but not annoy that many people. But also, it won't generate masses of money. I mean, if you doubled IHT, it would generate another five billion. Double mm. CGT, which, which linking it to income tax rates would, and we've done that before, that pushes it up 20 billion. But then you sort of got to give some indexation relief with that as well. I think a bit of that, and then the broad base, one P from everybody type thing with a little bit more on high rate, then you get closer to it over time. I mean, we don't have to solve. We don't have to get it all in in one year, do we? And you just... <laughs> Generation to pay it. They're making yeah. the generations paying the contribution rather yeah. than kicking the road to the student generation who no. already got debt. Yeah. No, quite. Uh, you can see actually with the wealth tax and liquidity issue. I was just thinking last night, you think, well, you could, if you've got a house and you want to tax it, you could sort of create a gradual debt and you only tax, you get tax out of something on wealth when an event happens, you know, with capital gains, when you sell something and with a, when with inheritance tax, when it passes to someone. So effectively, then that, well, that's just like increasing the rate of inheritance tax, isn't it? But that wouldn't sound good either politically, would it? So we'll call it something else. Yeah. There's a range of things, but the other thing to bear in mind here on, on will it, I think is also, I know it was only an answer in prime minister's question time, but Boris Johnson quite clearly resisted and, and gave a very clear message of we won't introduce a wealth tax in that answer on the day of the summer statement when Annalise Dodds made the point about a wealth mm. tax. And he completely shot it down and said we won't do that. And it's the Labour Party who are behind this kind of thing, not us. I mean, again, I know U-turns are the thing, but he made that. That was the most clear reference point, albeit only as an answer in Prime Minister's question time. But you can have it by dressing it up in a different way. Dressing it up, absolutely. Because at the end of the day, if you want to get the money in, it doesn't really matter. what You, you need to dress it up so that you yeah. get your end result to your point of what is the point of the tax? What is the aim? What's the objective? Yeah, definitely. Okay, now that's, that, that's really interesting. So messaging and communication is uh, uh, a, a, key, uh, a key for any tax issue. Um, and messaging and communication has certainly been a theme for government during this um, <laughs> crisis, albeit maybe not a very uh, encouraging um, or, in, or inspiring one. Um, when we come to actually financial advisors um, and the, uh, the, gra the grassroots level, um, let's say for, for argument's sake that the government was, was going to introduce some type of wealth, wealth tax, what can advisors practically do um, for their um, for their clients, how can they prepare prepare them for for, for it? Um, how do advisors say um, handle the the emotion of that um, subject with a with a with a client? Any Michael, I I think that's 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 fairly straightforward. So I think let's caveat right now. This is all speculation, right? The, the UK government has not committed to a wealth tax, as, as Tony Well said. In fact, has denied the fact that they would even do something like this. But going with your example, if they were to do so when we have more clarity around the government's intention on this, I think financial planners can add tremendous value to clients because what we can do is show the clients how this wealth tax might affect their financial plan, if at all. So, you know, you, you can let them come to that conversation with their emotions and with all the, the, the baggage, for the lack of a better term, that they've absorbed through the, the press or through, you know, uh, television, etc. But then you can actually demonstrate to them from a financial planning perspective, look, you don't need to react to this news, which is what normally causes people to make mistakes. Here's the plan, and this is how it's going to affect you, if at all. And these are some of the things that we can do about it. So again, a planning conversation, what it does is it allows us to, as planners, to hear out the emotions and then work with the client to say, OK, I've heard you. I, I, I empathize with that. Can I put that to a side for a second? Now let's actually see how this filters through to your financial plan, if at all. Isn't that an excellent opportunity? Well, the planning community to dust down the portfolio of clients, making sure everything's everything's running to the maximum, whether it's ISAs, pensions, inheritance tax planning, the next generation, linking it up. I mean, many advisors don't work with the next generation. Here's an excellent opportunity 
to open up the open up the debate for well, if something like this occurs, how do we work to pass on wealth to the next generation? So I think there's fantastic opportunities for financial planners to to, to coach their clients through the the the, the, the myriad of changes that might come. What about what do you think, Casal? Do you think um, that that advisors that it would be easy for advisors to uh, to handle handle it or? I think when it comes to inheritance tax, this is uh, a key message we use because pl financial planning, I mean, people talk about financial planning and everything, it usually comes to a particular product uh, and its implementation. That is not really financial planning. The real planning is um, what I've experienced now with this intergenerational stuff is making people understand that. When you leave this planet, you will simply take what you first came with. And there's no point accumulating vast estates, building legacies, etc., unless you can live that benefit now, because you won't take anything. There'll be no attachments and it doesn't really matter. What people want to do is to contribute to society. Nobody said, oh, you, you know, I, I don't like these uh, income taxes. I want a reduction in income tax. They want to actually pay more. They make proactive charitable con contributions. But when they see this reality that they are sitting on a sizable estate, paying management fees, paying all sorts of fees, with this prospect of an inheritance tax burning on their children or their grandchildren, whilst those same subjects are paying interest rates or rent or mortgage payments to third parties, what really is the purpose? of all of this going on, because there's detriment from bo both sides. So it's the planner's job to explain, if you really want to establish a purpose, tell me what happens the day you pass away. Where does everything go? What is your real legacy? Why is it that we have all of this now when the other people are paying so much? And that's mm -hmm. what it's begins to say or to reveal that as long as there's that safety within the plan that they're looked after, they're more than happy to gift it out. So if there is any additional wealth tax, which we already do with inheritance tax, my advice is to gift money now and direct, rather than hanging into things. Because it really doesn't matter when people pass away, they don't really care. Okay, just an interesting point. Yeah, I know, I, know I, I certainly largely have to agree with Everybody really <laughs> with everyone. Um, yeah, um, yeah I, I, I think Amir's point, John's point, that it's just so, uh, just so important. This point of, of planning is, it's there's a good example right now. I think we've had probably both of you, all, all parties contributing. They've had questions around should I do anything about CGT? We've had a couple of questions through clients of, of ours, through advisor clients of ours, with clients saying, shall I sell down in case, in case. CGT gets linked to income tax and you go, would you do it anyway? No, I wouldn't, but I don't want to. So that, that kind of balanced view that uh, Amir really well expressed to just say, just wait a second, take the emotion out of it. Now let's just, let's just think about this before we do anything. And I think that's the thing we can't, we wouldn't advise anything. Wait and see if there is a plan and then in a balanced, calm way. Take it. So that isn't adding anything more. It's just, just not said it as well as everyone else has just said it. The plan is absolutely critical to this to be the point. I think it's also it is important to be ahead of the game though, to have a view on something. Clearly, all three people who do planning here have a view on that so that a client feels they can have a decent conversation, even though there's they don't need to take any action. They feel reassured. They feel reassured in not taking any action. I think the anxiety comes from, should I be doing something now? Should I have I missed an opportunity? And that discussion with a financial planner takes should if they're a good plan that takes away that anxiety you say no okay i've got your back basically that's, that's our role no that's a very that's a really good point um in in terms of uh reassuring the client to, to what extent is there a, is there a danger um of uh advisors and all their clients uh potentially taking some action uh, to uh, based on the fear of avoiding a wealth tax, which actually never happens. Is, it's is, it's uh, well, it's, it's huge, especially for do-it-yourself investors. It's huge, and it's 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 the same risk that 
do-it-yourself investors take with any other noise that lives around the financial services sector. And there's a lot of it. There's there's an absolute there's heaps of it. All you need to do is turn on the television to see what the or read any newspaper to see what the crisis du jour is. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, uh, look, uh, I think that is it, we're speaking in our own bubble here. Of course, the theme of this is all around our sector, financial services. I'm sure it's the same for any other sector. I'm sure if we went to a, a dentist's round table, there would be some noise around, you know, Invisalign um, teeth uh, things that uh, a lot of people get wrong because they try to go onto a do-it-yourself um, strategy rather than than really work with a professional that can help them. So, to your point, Michael, uh, what the wealth tax is just another opportunity for people to react to a bit of news or a lot of news as it may be Mm. depending on the messaging and unfortunately make mistakes and you know what folks need to realize is sometimes the cost of a big mistake can vastly outweighs what the cost of working with a financial planner would be sure totally i can certainly from a little just only a few months back when the wealth tax discussion was a little more noisy uh, there were people considered what what could i do if a wealth tax came what could i do to kuzal's point make gifts away but you'd need to fragment it otherwise you're just passing on the wealth tax to another person effectively yeah. or people the, the biggest number of questions we have were worry about some form of exchange control or you know sort of capital controls of being able to move my money out of the country that was more labor government fear of capital controls but I think so the only way strictly speaking you go is give it away and fragment it when you look at practically if there were to be something but let's wait and see if there were anyway PS it's unlikely I think under this government um, and then the, the only real way is to say you know leave the country because just having your wealth somewhere else in the countries that do have a wealth tax they tax your global wealth not just wealth within that country so you need to move the body as well as the wealth but Here's, a, here's one uh, for, for you, Tony, maybe, because um, there was this rumour, whisper, uh, several years ago when Cameron was uh, in the last election that Labour were about to introduce the 1970s uh, rent tax because there is this problem where there's part-time landlords owning a couple of properties here and there and crowding the market so that people can't become first-time buyers. So they were thinking about bringing in the rent tax to counter that, um, the Conservatives came up with a, an alternative strategy, as you know, which is restricting the tax relief, which has immediately meant that some people through the back door have had to realise, well, actually, this doesn't make any sense. So they're selling those properties. They've realised it doesn't make financial sense. Do you see anything like that happening, uh, a back door way of getting people to solve a problem, such as the property market? I don't think so within not... And you, I think the, the the pathway has been set with the property market and it's tough enough as it is. And I think it's interesting when you see even with the wealth tax, back to sort of subject, that most people in that FT service seem to, when you looked at which assets do you think are it will be most appropriate and fair, most people alighted on second properties. You know, not on main, but it was second properties. And that's the, what it comes down to, really. And properties that you don't live in. So either you rent out or you, they're a holiday home then they are the ones that should be attacked. And there's been a pretty strong attack on those. So I think to change strategy on something that's already working, so to speak, is probably unlikely. And that's going to come under pressure because everyone's saying the housing market is booming at the moment, as we know, and the run-up. Yeah, yeah, good point. Great. That's really getting hit is low-paid workers, young people, people in the hospitality and event sector, usually are rent. They're the the renters, aren't they? So... There's a fair chance that they're the people who are going to face into unemployment and therefore the private landlords or the accidental landlords of two or three flats might find they've got defaulters on their hands. So that whole sector could be coming under a lot of pressure quite soon. Mm. They mostly pay interest only on the, on these flats and things, property that they own. And yeah. uh, they can ride it out for a little while. But if this thing goes on for a long time, I see it potentially that sector could have, could have structural problems. Mm. And the sector that lent money to them on an interest-only basis, <laughs> of course. Absolutely. So there's no unintended consequences going on here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Definitely so. Uh, just a fi- final, final, final question. Um, I know that, uh, but with the, uh, uh, I'm just bringing back to a potential a wealth tax, if it's harder for people to travel and harder for people to leave the country, is it, 
easier for government to get their stuff with a with a potential wealth tax. It's a good point. If you had a, so a national because, lockdown because, and a block on any travel whatsoever, then <laughs> as we said, the only way to properly avoid wealth tax, if a wealth tax were applied, to move to abroad. But it's but it is technically it's harder to move abroad now, or it's harder to travel at least. I mean, since it's since good. within the flights yeah. and everything. I'm sure the most wealthy would tend to find a way to do that. Right, <laughs> right. Your yeah. private jets yeah. and stuff. Right. Best way out of here. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. you're still going out. You're you're staying in the country. Yeah, <laughs> we're here. Can't got my season ticket. <laughs> and the fourteen ninety five box office per match to watch you lose at home to Leicester. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, no. Seriously, yeah. I, that's a, it's a great point. I suppose if you can't Oops. travel, then you. But how long can that last for? I mean, that's really, you know, if we're looking at this, I probably no wealth tax introduced till after the, if there was even one, and it's highly unlikely, I think, and that's sometime next year. Hopefully the pandemic's over. Hopefully there's something, you know, you know, there's more normality restored, in which case travel is not going to be banned forever. You can't well, stop hmm. travelling forever. I, I just I just know that I've, I've heard everyone talk about when we get a, when we get a vaccine, I never heard anyone say if we get a vaccine. It's always been when, um, and it seems a fairly. I mean, I'm not a doctor or scientist, but it seems a, you know fairly fairly big there's assumption. There's a big difference between when and if. You know, even if, even if we get a vaccine, the virus will probably not go away. So we're probably going to have to learn to live with this thing. Absolutely, couldn't agree. Well, the, well, the latest that. vaccine they've got is actually causing mutations within the virus which we don't know what the secondary implications of those are going to be. I mean, the entire concept for me is like, oh, you mm. live with some slow, some don't mutations in a virus, and then, OK. <laughs> well, they reported this morning that 80% of the cases in the UK are, are mutating from yeah. Sp Spanish farm Spanish. Yeah, so happy days. Mm, happy days, indeed. <laughs> um, so it takes you all the way back to the role of financial planners is to be reassurers and coaches to, to the customer base. And um, the thing where I think what happened with COVID is that people really divorced from the finances. People who were established, they were like, look, we've got family to look after. There are far more important things to do now and think about money. Whilst on the other side, the people who were financially highly vulnerable with the job losses and everything, they suddenly paid more attention to their money. This is why this, with any scenario, it's a great opportunity for real planners yeah. to really empathize and understand what the purpose of all of this is. And mm -hmm. if we convince people or have a meaningful discussion of people about what really is the purpose of all this wealth. What's the plan? That's when you realize, actually, this doesn't matter. I mean, uh, some somebody sent me that because I'm, I'm into all these historic property. They sent me this Facebook group called abandoned properties i was like i went to have a look at some of the property these are mansions amazing lovely properties built not so long ago and they're completely derelict and abandoned and i'm thinking what a complete waste so people you know it, i me personally i am not going to leave any estate or luxury items i'll leave experiences and knowledge that's me personally but everybody's different sure yeah. No, I think I think that's a, a very very good point. Is is there anything else that uh, 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 any of you uh, any other point that, that you uh, any of you would like to cover or go over again? I would just say, just lend them to I think it's a fascinating time because to the point made right at the very beginning politically, it's really interesting that we've got a conservative government. That's you know, that's done so much with furlough and all that, pouring money into the economy. And, and I, I, I really wouldn't like to be in the cabinet table having to resolve the, the economics of it, of uh, trying to come up with taxes and not call them wealth taxes, and yet solve some of the problems. The Chancellor's got to find money to put in the pot, and he's got to get it from somewhere. So that's the, that's the big exam question. And at the same time, John, to your point, what, what the government also need to do is, is continue encouraging the UK to be seen as 
a country that is strong, that has a superb first class legal framework for other companies to come in and actually help generate wealth through entrepreneurialism. After all, after Brexit, that's it, right? The, the UK needs to be attractive to the biggest, best financed, Somebody, most well staffed companies in the world. Brexit, didn't they? Somebody had to go and spoil it and mention Brexit. Yeah, I know quite. But having a having a, a regime of high taxes, corporate taxes especially doesn't do that. I'm totally with you on that, Amir, that we need to re re remain attractive. And also, but we do need to have that stability to our finances to, for our world partners, buyers of government bonds going, actually, investing in this country, do they have a plan? You know, so it's an interesting balance. Back to John's point. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be at that table. It's a very difficult one. I suppose all they can breathe a little sigh of relief is the IMF have said it's all right to push it, you know, kick the can down the road. Yes. Till next year, till after Christmas, we'll deal with it then, kind of thing. And I could, I completely sympathise with that, really. I think it was mm. the Romans that coined the phrase bread and circus. And, you know, 2,000 odd years later, we're still here, bread and circus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, that's absolutely uh, terrific, everyone. Um, thank you very, very much for, for, for your time. Uh, any, any final points? Oh, all good. Thank well, you. Sorry to offend anybody who thought Trident was a, a vital necessity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Nuclear. Love that. That's a perfect note on which to end. That's yes. Great. Thank great. you. Great. Bye, bye. Thank you. See you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.